There are four great forces that uh, affect us in our Christian life, and I want to share those four forces with you today. But before that, people in the world today, even Seventh-day Adventists, you know, are looking for and hoping for peace. And we live in a world where it seems like peace is shattered and uh, the politicians and people can't find it. But you know, real peace, and real joy, real happiness comes from Jesus, doesn't it? You know, there are some people that live in yesterday, they worry about tomorrow, and so they don't have any peace for today. And there are probably some in every congregation that feel that way. Well, number one, you can't do anything to change yesterday. And, you know, there's no sense worrying about things that may never happen tomorrow. And so you need to follow what David says in Psalm 119 when he says, Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall cause them to stumble. So for today, we need to love God uh, enough to trust him trust him enough to be obedient to him. And so instead of worrying about things that you can't change, you need to learn to put your trust in God. Remember Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 6, God knows everything that you have need of. And if you love him enough to trust him and trust him enough to be obedient to him, he will supply to you those things that you need. He enjoys supplying you with the things that you need. And so you can soar above the problems that you face. There, uh, Isaiah knew something about flying. There, uh, he lived 2,500 years before the Wright brothers. But uh, he said in, in chapter 40 of his book, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. And so, you see, peace, real peace, satisfying peace comes from only one place, and that's from God. Amen. Soaring from this world by faith into the very arms of a loving Savior. My Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the measure of faith that you have given to us. But Father, we want a greater measure of faith. There are times before us that are thrilling and yet far frightening. And we need greater faith to face the future than what we have now. And so I pray that you would anoint my lips as I share with your people how we all may have a greater measure of faith in Jesus, our precious Redeemer. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. There are four forces uh, at work in the world today. And uh, they affect your Christian life. And uh, two of them are positive and two of them are negative. And what you do with those forces will determine how you live your life and the peace that you have in your life. There, in, in uh, Sabbath school, somebody uh, talked about flying. He must have been a pilot or is a pilot, but he talked about the different uh, weight of the plane and the speed they have to go. There, I love flying, and uh, when you take your pilot's test, uh, you have to know some things about aerodynamics. There, when a plane negotiates uh, for specific forces, it can lift off and fly. And so I want to draw some lessons from those four forces uh, that a plane needs to leave the ground and fly in the air. Uh, and the first one uh, is thrust. And thrust is the, the force that pushes the plane down the runway. And the plane has to reach a certain speed before it can lift off. 
And as the plane is pushing its way down the runway, it has to overcome the drag that is on it. And so drag, that's the second factor of flying. The first is thrust, the second is drag. And drag is the friction that resists the forward movement of the airplane. So you can see thrust and drag are uh, diametrically opposed from each other. But when the thrust overcomes the drag, you can begin to have liftoff. But there are two other things also. And uh, lift. Lift is the force that happens when the air moving over the wing there lifts the plane up. Now, there is a law in aerodynamics. It's called Bernoulli's law. And Bernoulli says that when the molecules of air hit the front of the wing, those same molecules have to meet at the back end of the wing. Now, the wing is curved. The bottom is flat, but then it curves like this, which means if those molecules that split at the front of the wing, they have to meet at the back of the wing. That means the molecules going over the top of the wing have to go faster to meet the ones that go on the flat part uh, of the bottom of the wing. And uh, as the air uh, moves faster over the curved top of the wing, meeting the air, the molecules that flow under the wing, this creates pressure on the underside there and helps the lift to overcome the weight of the plane. And that's the fourth thing, and that's weight. Weight is the force created by gravity and the weight of the plane that wants to keep you on the ground. There, uh, and so there the lift and the thrust have to overcome the drag and the weight. And when thrust overcomes drag and lift overcomes weight, your plane will take and lift off from the runway and uh, you can have a pleasure uh, in flying your plane. And as I said, I would like to use these four aerodynamics forces uh, as a way of understanding four forces that are at work today uh, to try and two, to separate us from Christ and two, to have us have a greater faith and walk with Jesus. That's what Jesus wants. And thrust is like faith. There, uh, and we need to ask, what is faith? Faith, true faith, I mean real faith, is trusting in God when you can't see the future. And none of us can see the future, can we? There, but it's trusting in God when you can't see the future. And you know, Jesus said in, in John, uh, the 16th chapter. Uh, he says, you know, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have what? Overcome the world. I've overcome the world. So we can overcome the world through Christ. And so we need to have a greater faith than what we have. You see, it is faith, only faith, that helps us to become partakers in the grace of Christ. And it is faith which enables us to render obedience to Christ. So you can see the importance of faith in our lives for each one of us to have faith. And God gives to everyone a measure of faith. Now what will you do with that measure of faith that he has given you? Like a plant, it needs to be nourished and grow to grow. I want to read a statement from the book, Steps to Christ. It's found on page 60, it's the second paragraph. But she says this, but Christ has made a way of escape for us. He lived on earth amid trials and temptations such as we have to meet. He lived a sinless life 
He died for us. And now he offers to take our sins and to give us his righteousness. If you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life may have been. Did you get that? As sinful as your life may have been, no matter how sinful your life was, she said, for his sake, you are accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character. And you are accepted before God just as if you had never sinned. Isn't that a tremendous statement? That's what Christ wants to do for each one of us. But then she goes on. More than this, Christ changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. You are to maintain this connection with Christ by faith and the continual surrender of your will to him. And so long as you do this, he will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So notice, all God asks for us is to trust him enough, you know, to love him and love him enough to be obedient to him. And he'll do everything else for us. Everything else for us. The greatest victories that we will ever gain in life are gained by faith through prayer in the audience chamber with God in the heavenly sanctuary. It's with agonizing prayer and faith that you lay hold to the mighty arm of God. You know, we don't realize how many of you have really agonized with God in prayer. I can remember I retired December 31 of last year after pastoring for 48 years. But, uh, And I'm sure your pastor does the same thing because he loves you. But uh, I would wake up at one in the morning and pray. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and I would pray. And in my mind, I would see the faces of all those 285 people in my congregation. And I would lift each one of them in prayer, agonizing with God for them. Because everybody comes here, and if you ask them, how's your day? How are you doing? You know what they'll say. They'll say everything's going great. You know, everything's good. But you don't know, as your pastor does, what they're really going through in life. You don't know the burden that they carry. You don't know the hurt that they're feeling. And so I'm sure your pastor, like me, rose out of bed early in the morning and lifts you up in prayer because he loves you. And he will pray as I prayed. And it seemed like 20 minutes have gone by. And you wake up to crawl back into bed. And you look at the clock. And sometimes it's 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm sure your pastor, the same way, agonizes over each one of you, lifting you up before God. You see, the greatest victories we gain in life again by faith through prayer in the audience chamber with God when with earnest agonizing prayer your faith lays hold of the mighty arm of God you know this is what John said in 1st John chapter 5 and verse 4 he says this is the victory that overcomes the world even our what 
even our faith, even our faith. So you can see how important faith is. You see, it is faith that enables us to look beyond the present and its burdens and its frustrations and its perplexities. And we all face, you know, at times, there are burdens and perplexities. There we have a problem, we don't know how to face it. But faith enables us to look past those. It enables us to look in the sanctuary above where Jesus stands at the right hand of God, interceding for each one of us. Faith sees Jesus, but it also sees the mansions that God has gone to pray for us. You know, it sees streets of gold. It sees a foundation of precious stones. It sees 12 gates. It sees the, new Jer the, the Garden of Eden within the New Jerusalem. It's going to be Central Park like New York. But the Garden of Eden is inside the New Jerusalem. Central Park. We could call it Central Eden, I guess. And we're all going to enjoy walking through it, resting in it, talking to one another uh, in it. You know, faith sees, you know, Christ preparing mansions for each one of us. And faith helps us to see the homes that God has prepared for us in the new earth when it's recreated all over again. You know, the, the homes will be there for us to inhabit. Sister White tells us that they are held up by pillars of silver. God spares no expense in your happiness. Not only that, but faith helps us to see the robe and the crown that Jesus himself will put on your head at that time. And faith hears the song of the redeemed on Mount Zion. You know, I like what Ron Walters uh, said. He, he sort of sums it up. He says, faith is following a God whose audible voice we have never heard. Loving a Savior whose wonderful face we have never seen. Declaring the Bible as truth to a culture who doubts it in planning an eternity in a place where we have never been. That's what faith does, you see. There's an old saying, seeing is believing. But faith does not have to see to believe, as Hebrews 11 says. It takes God at his word, because God cannot lie, cannot lie. But in aerodynamics, <laughs> As faith has to overcome drag, so faith has to overcome doubt. And Satan will never cease to put doubt in your minds. Never cease. There, you remember Eve listened to the serpent and doubted God when he said not to eat of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. You know, Satan said there has not God said. There, uh, and then he ended by saying, you will not surely die. And we see the results of that mistake in the world today. You know, Abraham doubted God. And the result of that doubt was Ishmael. And we see the results of that in the world today. The Middle East is in turmoil. The African nations, the mayhem in Europe and the world today, and the fear in the United States that, you know, we will be struck over here as the Europeans have been. And we have been struck over here, haven't we? <laughs> During their 40 years in the wilderness, Israel doubted God. And thousands of them died and lost out in entering the promised land. You know, Jacob doubted God, listened to his mother there, and stole his brother's birthright. Stole his blessing as a result, I should say, and as a result, 
it brought disaster to the family. Peter walked on water there until he got scared and doubted, and then he began to sink. And he said, Lord, save me. And Jesus reached out his hand and grabbed him. And what did Jesus say? Oh, you have a little faith. Why on earth did you doubt? He said, I'm here. How could you doubt that anything could happen to you? Ellen White wrote, the obstacles that hinder our progress will never disappear before a halting and doubting spirit. You see, faith takes God at his word. Faith believes the promises of God. So if you want a strong faith, you need to fill your mind with spiritual thoughts. In Colossians chapter 3, there, uh, Paul writes this. He says, beginning with verse 1, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And so if you want a strong faith, a real faith, a dynamic faith, you need to set your mind, your thoughts on things above. If you don't set your thoughts on things above, Satan will bring in thoughts into your mind. And so we need to fill our mind with spiritual things. They think about what God is preparing for us there uh, in the new earth. Let your mind soar. You know, you stop and think there, the, the universe out there. In fact, in uh, the church that I retired from, Peter uh, is working on the, the telescope they were supposed to send up in November here. Uh, it's been postponed, I think, till December. But uh, he is a specialist in lenses. And the new telescope that they're sending up will see farther than the Hubble telescope is able to see. And the Hubble telescope today can look 14 billion light years. And, you know, they, they focused the Hubble telescope in one area where it was blank. And uh, they left it like that for 20 hours. And uh, then the picture came back to the jet propulsion there, uh, and they uh, uh, worked with it and, and uh, got it so they could see it. And when they saw it, they saw literally the whole area filled with galaxies. And one of the scientists said, you know, it seems like there is no end to the universe. Well, you look out there, 14 billion light years. Now stop and think. You will have the ability one day to travel like the angels travel. When you read Daniel chapter 9, there the first part, Daniel is praying. And <clears throat> he's saying, look, Lord, the 70 weeks that, that Jeremiah predicted, they must be. Uh, near the end. And he's pleading for his people that God will forgive them and bring them back uh, to Israel. Now, if you read that prayer, it takes about four minutes for the average person to read that prayer. So Daniel begins to pray. And uh, as he's praying, God uh, mentions to Gabriel, he says, Gabriel, come here a minute. So Gabriel comes over. And God says, you remember that uh, prophecy that we gave to Daniel 13 years ago? I want you to go down and explain to him that verse that you didn't explain. Daniel 8, 14. And so the rest of chapter 9 is Gabriel's explanation of Daniel 8, 14, part of it. But the amazing thing is, when God spoke to Gabriel, the next thing Daniel knows is Gabriel is standing beside him, tapping him on the shoulder. And he says, Daniel, greatly beloved, God has sent me to share with you 
that part of the vision you didn't understand. So within a blink of an eye, Gabriel came from wherever he was to where Daniel was. Who knows how many millions or billions of light years away. But Gabriel was there. You and I one day will have the ability to think and to be where we want to be throughout the endless recesses, recesses of the universe. Can you imagine thinking and being on a, a world that's 13 billion light years from Earth? God has a means of travel that we know absolutely nothing about. And if you love God enough to trust Him, trust Him enough to be obedient to Him, God says, I will let you enjoy that travel and see those places that only in your imagination you can see today. Well, the devil wants to weigh you with burdens so that you can't stand under them. You know, when you have so many burdens you can't stand, you need to kneel and begin praying because God will give you the strength and the faith to be able to go through. Satan will try and bring doubt, which faith must push through. And so you need to have a stronger faith, especially as we enter into the end times that we are in. A stronger faith that will push through the doubt that Satan will put there in front of you. God has given us something that will strengthen our faith so that doubt is banished in our minds. God has given it to us and he's given it to every one of you here today. And if you don't have it, you can get it. And that's his word. God has given his word so that we can see him and know him that he will carry us through if we trust him. If we trust him. In God's word, we can see the result of doubt, but we can also see the result of faith, can't we? Time after time, we see what faith can do. There, <clears throat> I think of what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, and reading verse 4. There he says, Why, but whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world through lust. Can you imagine that? He said, exceeding great and precious promises are given to us. And why? He says that we might become partakers of the divine nature. But that happens when we, through faith, reach out after God. Reach out, cleave to God. You know, David's mighty men, when you read that chapter, talks about Beniah and uh, him fighting. There, uh, uh, I think it was 200 Philistines. And it says he fought so hard that his hand cleaved to his sword. In other words, when the fight was all over and he went to put the sword back in the sheath, he had held it so tight for so long he couldn't uncurl his fingers from the handle. And that's how we need to cleave to God, to let nothing at all separate us from him in any way. Now, there is another partner to faith that is important, and that is prayer. Faith leads us to prayer, and prayer strengthens our faith. I want to read to you what Ellen White wrote uh, about prayer and faith. She says, true faith and true prayer, how strong they are. They are as two arms by which the human suppliant lays hold upon the power of infinite love. Faith is trusting God, believing that he loves us and knows what is for our best good. Thus, instead of choosing our own way, it leads us to choose his way. 
in place of our ignorance, it accepts his wisdom. In place of our weakness, his strength. In place of our sinfulness, his righteousness. Our lives, ourselves, are already his. Faith acknowledges his ownership and accepts its blessing. Truth, uprightness, purity are pointed out as secrets of life's success. It is faith that puts us in possession of these. Every good impulse or aspiration is the gift of God. Faith receives from God the life that alone can produce true great growth and efficiency. So you see how important faith is in the life of each one of us. So we have God's word that reveals the mind of God, reveals to you your state of being and the way of salvation and the safety, the only safety that believers have. And so as doubt tries to destroy faith, so the worldview tries to destroy belief in God's word. And the worldview reflects a rebellious attitude, whether subtly or blatantly. And it's amazing how blatantly we are seeing it being taught to our kids uh, in, in public school. Amazing. The worldview is designed to exclude God's right over his creation. And this rebellious worldview began in Eden, when Satan challenged the validity of God's word and said, has not God said? and ended up with saying, you will not die. And this rebellious worldview from that day to this has tempted every generation to dismiss God's rights over their lives. And one of the greatest evidences of the truth of God's word there and that there is a God, you know, is when you look at the prophecies that you see in God's word, that when you look for instance, it, in Isaiah, Isaiah wrote 150 years before Cyrus conquered Babylon. But there in Isaiah, God says, I have surnamed you, even though you have not known me. And then God describes how he will conquer Babylon, the indefensible city that no one thought could be conquered. Daniel chapter 2. God gives a view of this world. Chapter 7, he enlarges on it. In chapter 8, he enlarges even more on it. Chapter 9, he describes the prophecy of the Messiah that would come. Isn't it amazing that the God who created you, even before he created one world in this universe. He knew in, cre in creating what would take place. And yet he loved you so much that he was willing to give his life to save you. And you know, that's not all. When you read uh, early writings, page uh, 18, 19. The redeemed are in the holy city with that silver table that is miles in length. Yes, she says, our eyes could extend over its length. And what does Jesus say? He says, come, and I will gird myself, and I will serve you. That's what God is like. That's what God is like. That's how much he loves you. He wants you there. He wants to serve you your first meal in the holy city. And it's Jeremiah and Ezekiel. You know, there have been many over the centuries that have predicted the demise of the Bible and the Christian faith. I think of Diocletian, emperor of Rome. He killed so many Christians, burned so many Bible manuscripts, that he erected a column there in Rome 
And on that column, he had engraved these words, Extincto Nomine Christianorum, which means the name of Christ is forever extinguished. Well, Diocletian is dead, <laughs> but the name of Christ is on the lips of billions of people in this world today. I think of Voltaire, who said that his writings would destroy Christianity in a generation. Well, Voltaire is dead. And the building in which he wrote that statement is a bookstore that sells Bibles. I think of Thomas Paine, who in an effort to completely discredit the Bible wrote the book, The Age of Reason. He said, when I get through, there will not be five Bibles left in America. But today the Bible is the most popular book that is sold. Albert Einstein, the man whom Time Magazine named the man of the century, denied the existence of a personal God, but instead believed in pantheism. Carl Sagan, the brilliant astrophysicist, a Pulitzer Prize winner, said there is no God unless you call the laws of nature God. Stephen Hawking, who believed, who achieved enormous scientific success despite his suffering from severe ALS disease, said there is no heaven and there is no God. That is just a fairy tale to those who are afraid of the dark. And I think of Edwin Hubble, the astronomer, for whom the Hubble telescope is now named after. You know, they, they built that first huge telescope on, on Mount Wilson, you know, the observatory, and they put that, at that time was the biggest telescope in the world, uh, in there. And Hubble went in and opened that dome, and he peered through the telescope. And when he looked out there at all those stars that he thought were suns shining brightly throughout the universe, he was astonished. He could hardly believe his eyes. Those weren't suns at all. Those were galaxies like ours. Millions and billions of galaxies out there. And as he looked at them, enthralled, all of a sudden it hit him. Every one of those galaxies, they're moving toward the red shift in the light spectrum. And the Doppler effect tells us that objects moving away from you, they move into the redshift of the light spectrum. And objects coming toward you are in the blue light of the light spectrum. Or I should say the blue shift of the light spectrum. And so he turns the telescope 180 degrees because he wanted to see what was coming towards our galaxy. He turns it 180 degrees, he puts his eye to the telescope, the little piece there, and he looks through, and he's shocked. I mean, all those worlds, all those planets, they're all moving in the redshift, which means they're all moving away from planet Earth. And so he moves it 90 degrees, and he looks. And the same thing. So he puts it 180 degrees, looks in the other direction. The same thing. It's in the red shift. Which means the whole universe is moving away from the Earth. Which means that the Earth is either at the center of the universe or is very close to the center of the universe. Now being an atheist, when he wrote his book, entitled Cosmology, on page 64. He says, we must never make any one place the center of the universe. The reason is he knew that if the earth was the center of the universe, it had to be created by God. And he didn't believe in God. 
So in his book, he denies what he saw through the telescope. And he comes out with this uh, statement. He said, the reason it's moving toward the redshift is because the light waves are getting farther and farther apart. And uh, we have an Adventist astrophysicist. In fact, both uh, David Gaines and his son are astrophysicists. And he got his doctorate degree right here in Florida. And he was telling how he was sitting in class one day, and the teacher was talking about this, and, and the, the light waves getting farther and farther apart. And uh, when he got all done, in fact, Dean said he had a, a chalkboard that was 40 feet in length. And when he got down to the end, there, uh, he stopped and uh, he said, he turned and looked at us. He says, so I raised my hand and uh, I asked him, what happened to all the photon loss in this? And he said, the professor went back to the beginning of the board and started working through it. He got to the end and he turned and looked at us and he said, I don't know, I don't know. That got him thinking. And I think it was about 12 years ago, maybe 15, there he completed a mathematical hypothesis. Well, it wasn't a hypothesis, he actually worked it out. That showed that the photon loss in Hubble's answer would be three times greater than the weight of the universe. And he posted that mathematical equation on the bulletin board uh, for astrophysicists to see. And uh, in all this time, he's never had anyone refute what he came to, because he was correct. And the Earth is either at or near the center of the universe. And one day, but then why wouldn't God make the earth? Right here on the outside edge of this galaxy, the center of the universe. If one day he's going to be living here for all eternity future. So in conclusion, all these critics you know, they've won prestigious awards. They have written books that people devour. They, have, they are quoted in school books from grade one to through prestigious universities. They are all listed in WikiLeaks and in encyclopedias. And the world recognizes them for their brilliance. But, but they were all wrong. They are the ones that the psalmist targeted when he wrote, the one who rules in heaven laughs out loud, the Lord scoffs at them. But then on the flip side are the words of Isaiah, who says those who hope, we could say trust, who have faith in the Lord, will soar on wings like eagles. Yes, you will. If you trust God enough, love God enough to trust him and trust him enough to be obedient to him. And so push back the doubt that Satan will assail you with and have faith and cling to God's word. Immerse yourself in God's word, which will build your faith in the God that you love and serve. And you will soar Soar as never before on the wings of faith. You will soar into the loving arms of Jesus, who stretched them out in order to encircle all of you on Calvary.